Well, we'd best, I guess, now double back and get the prolactin story, which uh, you're perfectly situated to take me through. Yeah, we, we, the stage was set. We had the, in, in, in retrospect, uh, it, it, I mean, it wasn't planned this way, but there was a growing recognition and, and my interest on, on placental lactin, which had both growth hormone and prolactin-like uh, effects, uh, the, the clinical awareness, uh, the ability to measure growth hormone in blood for the first time, gave, um, gave one pause uh, for the easy conclusion that was the conventional wisdom of the day to say, well, humans are different. It was absolutely true that human growth hormone, primate growth hormone, has both prolactin-like and growth hormone-like activity, unlike growth hormone or prolactin from other species. Sheep, prolactin is pure, it has no growth-promoting activity. Sheep growth hormone, or sheep, pro, uh, yeah, sheep growth hormone has no prolactin-like activity, so the clear and separate. Rat is the same, all other species are the same. Human, it seemed, had, had, was different. And the uh, giants of the field, like C.H. Lee, uh, who had uh, discovered and isolated and purified so many pituitary hormones, dogma was dogmatic. Human growth hormone is a, bi is a bifunctional molecule, and it's the only one needed. That being true, it would follow then that in women who were breastfeeding, lactating, you should see high levels of growth hormone. Now that we could measure it, absolutely not. In, in women who had inappropriate expression of milk, galactorrhea, and a tumor of the pituitary, uh, you measured growth hormone, again, it was low. So either you had to say there's something unusual, unusually different in these people causing these tumors that is neither growth hormone nor prolactin, so you'd have to sort of uh, uh, suggest there's an entirely new molecule generated, or you could have the simple conclusion, no. The problem is we haven't been able to identify the molecule properly. It's definitely not growth hormone, and therein lay, in, in a sense, the solution. And Cal Ezrin, who, whom you may know from Toronto, using uh, uh, histological techniques, had shown there's an unusual set of, of, of cha microscopic changes in the pituitary during pregnancy or in women who are receiving estrogen or indeed in men who are receiving estrogen for prostatic cancer. There's a whole new kind of set of cells with special tinctorial properties that occur in abundance in, in these pituitaries. Might they be prolactin? Was his query. As a matter of fact, he was rediscovering what Erdheim and Stummy had described in careful descriptions in the, in the turn of the century, when women often died in childbirth, they had an abundance of material to study, showed not only is there change in the microscopic appearance, uh, the homogeneity of the cells of pituitary are taken over by pregnancy cells. And this was the early days when there was talk about or hormones they, they suggested, well, maybe, just maybe, these cells are the source of the milk production in lactating women. And, of course, they were right. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of that, then, the, the clue was, it's not growth hormone, it can't be from these tumors. So maybe the, the, the approach would be an immunologic one. The antibodies don't recognize this, uh, this molecule, antibodies to growth hormone, or maybe even better antibodies to placental lactogen, which we had in abundance in sheep. So we had buckets of, of antibodies available. So we, uh, we, uh, we began the, the, the studies in, um, in and I guess the other circumstance was that uh, Jules Hardy at, uh, at the Notre Dame Hospital was removing pituitaries through the transphenoidal route, pr a procedure he had developed, and would suck these tumors out, and we, uh, through John Beck's intervention, we gained access to these, and used exactly the same techniques as we had for pl studying placental lactogen. And, uh, and uh, separated these molecules in by size, 
and uh, having incubated them with radioactive uh, amino acids, followed the protein synthesis and saw this huge peak, just at the same size as, as growth hormone would be, and we could measure chemical amounts of growth hormone, and so see the correlation between the peaks of growth hormone and the radioactive peak, and then added antibodies to this, these samples from the, the peak, uh, antibodies to growth hormone or placental actin, and lo and behold, they, they didn't react with this radioactive compound. And I, I um, so, so the one thing it was not was growth hormone. And, and we conclude immediately, the one thing it must be is prolactin. Because in rat, if you did the same experiment, it would all be prolactin. <laughs> and uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, I went home when, I mean, we were very interested in watching the, 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 the counts come off the counter and plotted it. And I went home and announced to my mother-in-law, I uh, discovered new hormone. And, uh, you know, was fairly confident, maybe trying <laughs> to impress her. And, and as it turned out, it was right. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you've sketched it as a very beautiful piece of analysis in reality. Did the research project develop that easily? Well, well it was, you know, it was a fair bit of work, but, but it, it really, the, the logic that underpinned the approach and the analysis was just as I've outlined it. And, uh, and you know, the, these, uh, these studies take a bit of time to set up and do, but they actually worked, just as I've outlined them. Then, then it took probably another year from that original kind of, uh, uh, bragging, if you will, to actually prove definitively this is prolactin.